Good morning. Good morning, everybody. Everyone, look, we've been fighting now this whole year to bring our city back. New Yorkers have done an amazing, amazing job. And we know key to our recovery is vaccination. We have been talking about it nonstop because it's the thing that makes a difference. Vaccination is what has allowed us to keep going. And vaccination is what made, in particular, our schools so strong and so safe. Uh, parents right now want to know what's going to be happening next when schools come back January 3rd. We're going to talk about that today. But we start with a reminder that our schools have been extraordinarily safe. Bluntly, the safest places to be in New York City. Very low levels of COVID. Why? Because it started with making sure every single adult in our schools, everyone was vaccinated. Right now, 96% plus of Department of Education employees vaccinated. That has been one of the big difference makers, the gold standard of health and safety measures we put in place. Schools have been safe and schools are where kids need to be. President Biden has been so clear and strong on this message. I agree with him 100%. The science is clear. Schools need to be open. Everyone talks about the needs of our kids, their health needs, physical health, mental health, nutrition needs, their social development needs, their academic needs. Schools need to be open. And so we are moving every day to make sure our schools remain safe. We have been working very closely with the mayor-elect and his team to make sure everything is in place for January 3rd. And parents, look, thank you for everything you've done to protect your kids. And thank you to every parent who's gone out and gotten your child vaccinated. But I want to urge the parents, particularly younger kids, there's still too many kids who are not vaccinated. This is the time to do it. Any parent who's ready, any parent who chooses to, we are making uh, it easier than ever to get vaccinated. And if you want to get your child tested, we're making that choice available to you as well, adding more than 40 city-run test sites, 40 city-run test sites more to bring the total to over 160. So there's plenty of places you can get your child vaccinated. And if you want to test, more and more places you can get a test. Uh, parents, we need you. That's the part you can do. But what we're going to do also and this is an important announcement today, we're gonna to double the amount of testing we do every day in our schools. So right now, we do PCR testing in every school every week. We're gonna double the amount of testing we do in schools. Uh, greater sample size in each school, so we get even more accurate, clear results. Uh, we're gonna include both vaccinated and unvaccinated students. So two times the tests, and including vaccinated un and unvaccinated, and of course, teachers and staff as well. We're gonna do a big push to get more consent forms so we can get a bigger and bigger sample of the school. These are the things we're gonna to do to keep everyone safe. Uh, and we know the mo most important thing is vaccination. We know it works and everyone double down on it. And if you're eligible for that booster, remember up to Friday, you can get that $100 incentive. So those are some of the things we're gonna be doing immediately. But we're also gonna be using at-home test kits more and more. And I'm gonna talk about that in just a moment. But I wanna give a thanks up front uh, to Governor Hochul because she announced a major infusion of test kits uh, for our schools. Uh, that's gonna really help us uh, as we announce a new approach that's gonna keep kids safe but also keep schools open. Uh, so I want the governor to join us because I wanna express the appreciation of the people of New York City and my appreciation. Uh, these test kits are gonna help us fight back this yet another wave of COVID, but we're gonna fight through it and keep everyone safe and move forward as a city. My pleasure to bring to you Governor Kathy Hochul. Thank you, Mayor de Blasio, for your partnership and your collaboration from the very beginning to fight this surge. I remember we sat together, it was an evening we did, we just heard about the very first case of Omicron that appeared in New York State, in New York City. And that afternoon we sat together and pledged full cooperation together to let people know that we would be united in our attack on this virus and do everything we can to keep New Yorkers as well as every New York State resident safe. And to continue that pledge of collabor collaboration, I'm very pleased that we were able to literally just a couple of days ago send over 600,000 rapid tests uh, to your Department of Health last week. And we now have five state-run testing sites that will be launched tomorrow to help amplify your efforts already. 
and also hitting people where they go. I mean, the MTA is a great place for us to launch testing sites and we'll opening five more soon. We have two now. So, so those are all coming online and continuing to ramp up as well as uh, continuing our 37 pop-up sites and 17 more plans. So state and city working together, we're going to make sure that there's no shortage of supply, as well as making sure in the case we need ambulances, we just sent 10 more ambulances to New York City as well. But as you mentioned, Mayor, it is so important that we get our kids back to school as soon as this winter break is over. We all have such a strong public interest. We saw the failed experiment despite the very best efforts of incredibly hardworking, passionate teachers who did their very best with remote teaching, and the parents who were just pulling their hair out at kitchen tables trying to make sure that it worked successfully. Everybody did their part. But we also understand, as you mentioned, schools are safe we, as a result of our joint mandates, and I have a statewide mask mandate for children in school to make sure they're safe. Our teachers are vaccinated. So we all have to do our part to continue, though, to make sure that parents feel comfortable when they send their children back to school on January 3rd. So from our standpoint, what the state of New York can do to help best is to make sure that there are sufficient testing kits available to be used by the school district. And that is why I've directed our Department of Homeland Security and Emergency Services to provide 2 million tests, 2 million tests to New York City to allow children to stay in school. And I wanna thank our Department of Homeland Security and the Port Authority and DOT and commissioners of uh, all sorts of agencies, uh, general services, the three-way canals, they are all being deployed in a statewide effort, but also sending the first mil two million uh, tests, test uh, kits to make sure that they're available to help New York City schools because of the dense concentration of individuals in the city, the high population, and where we're seeing the rates go right now. So we are working around the clock to offer our best efforts to work with you the many calls we've had with uh, your departments. I love the collaboration that's going on between our departments of health, something that's been, was missing, but is now in full gear. And all the teacher unions, leaders, they've been on calls with us and the parents and everyone who are really working closely together to make this happen. I have a call just in a couple of hours with our statewide school superintendents because they're such critical partners in this effort as well. And I also appreciate uh, what the administration has been doing. The collaboration you've extended to us, but also to the incoming mayor-elect Eric Adams, that is what the public wants to see. They don't want any battling, uh, no turf battles here because we have one common battle to fight and that is against this variant. And I also wanna commend the teachers and the school leaders. They know we're all in this together. They've been asked to do so much, such extraordinary work, and we are forever grateful to them for what they've done in the past and what they're going to do now in this shortened time to make sure we can launch to the next semester with a safe environment for them and the students. So we're all in this together. I thank them. But lastly, as you mentioned, Mayor, parents, we could avert all this if every child were vaccinated. We still have time. We literally have hundreds of thousands of kids who have been safely vaccinated already. So you're not the first. You need to join the ranks of parents who've done the right thing for their children to make sure they're protected. This new variant is affecting children more than the past variants. Before we always said, don't worry so much, it's not really affecting children. That was a different variant. It is affecting children more, but the ones who are getting severely sick are so far only the unvaccinated children. So that should be the message you need to know right now that children can be exposed to this, contract it in rare cases, get sick, but only those who are unvaccinated. So that's why I so look forward to continuing to work with uh, Mayor de Blasio, yourself for your leadership, also incoming Mayor-elect Eric Adams. We've had many conversations. We'll continue getting our, keeping our schools open, continuing our economic recovery for all New Yorkers, as well as our paramount goal of protecting public health. So I wanna thank you for inviting me to participate here. Collective New Year's resolution, let's beat this together, get vaxxed, get boosted, wear a mask, get tested, and we will get through this together, New Yorkers. Hey man, that's a long New Year's resolution, <laughs> but it's a good one, it's a good one. Uh, Governor, thank you. And look, I really wanna amplify the point you made. Um, our kids need to be in school. Uh, remote learning, I agree with you, noble efforts by educators, school staff, but it's not the same thing. A lot of kids spend a year and a half without ever seeing a classroom. Uh, we know as parents how incredibly upsetting that was to their lives, to their development. Let's keep our kids in school. 
Let's all work together to make it work for our kids and our families. We can do it. Governor, thank you uh, for our, the great collaboration between our teams. And we will beat this together 100%. A very happy New Year to you. Very happy New Year to you. Thank you, Mayor. Now, everyone, as we said, um, we, we know how important our schools are in every sense to our kids and families. We know how important our schools are to the lives of working families. So many people right now working harder than ever to meet, make ends meet because of everything they've been through with COVID. Parents need their kids in school. And as we've learned more and more during the COVID era, we found new ways to do things. And our healthcare team has thought very carefully about how to approach this new reality where so many more people are vaccinated, thank God, and we're getting more people vaccinated every day. Also, Omicron is different. It comes with certain challenges, but we also know that it's different from other variants in ways that in some ways make it more manageable. We take all the information we've learned, all the experience we've had, listen to the data and the science, listen to the healthcare leaders, and now we've come up with a new approach, and those at-home tests are gonna be absolutely crucial. We've been working on this approach. What we need was the supply. Really appreciate the supply we're getting from the state. We're gonna get a supply from the federal government as well. This gives us a new approach, and that approach is called Stay safe and stay open. This is how we are going to look at schools from this point on. Keep them safe and keep them open. So when I say stay safe and stay open, it literally is in a very, very different way of making sure everyone's safe, adding this on top of everything that worked previously. So first of all, it comes with wide distribution of at-home test kits to every classroom. And when there's a positive case in a classroom, every child takes home at-home test kits. Um, every child who tests negative comes back to school. It's as simple as that. So long as they're asymptomatic and so long as they continue to test negative, they keep coming to school. We make sure that every kid has a test kit. Two will be taken in the course of seven days. And this guarantees more consistency in their education. It guarantees fewer disruptions, which parents have rightfully said have been a tremendous challenge for them. And it works because here's the fact we now know based on really extensive experience, 98% of close contacts, when someone has come in contact with some of the tested positive, 98% of close contacts don't turn into positive cases themselves. So the jury has come back. We have a lot of evidence now. It's told us this is the approach that's gonna work for the future. I have been working very closely with the mayor-elect as we've been planning together uh, for January 3rd, for Monday, January 3rd, when schools come back. There has been, uh, I have to say, a seamless transition. I want to thank the mayor-elect and his extraordinary team. I want to thank my team that have been working night and day closely with them. This is, I hope, New Yorkers will get to see this. This has been one of the smoothest and most collaborative and most positive transitions I've ever seen anywhere at any level of government. And the credit goes to our mayor-elect for the spirit he's brought to this. And I'd like to hear you, have you hear from him now about how important it is uh, to protect our kids and keep our schools open. My pleasure to introduce mayor-elect Eric Adams. Thank you uh, so much, mayor. And no, uh, mayor, the credit goes to you. Uh, far too many people are not aware of what has have uh, been taking place uh, behind the scene of uh, these last uh, few uh, months on how we have moved seamlessly uh, to transition government. That's what makes America uh, great, and that's what makes America's greatest city great, our uh, ability to have a smooth, smooth transition of power and authority. And you have done that. Uh, throughout the holiday weekend, uh, you and I have communicated throughout the night, throughout the mornings, uh, making sure that we were on page uh, because COVID uh, is a formidable opponent and it is organized on how it has affected and impacted our city. And if we're not organized, if we are, are not together and unified, uh, not pulling uh, ourselves apart uh, by trying to dispute and argue, uh, that will send the, the wrong message to New Yorkers. And you have gone out of your way stated that we will send a message to New Yorkers uh, that we are unified against uh, this formidable threat uh, to our economy and to the people of this city. And so I thank you. And I thank you for that important motto, uh, stay safe and stay open. 
uh, not only our schools, but our businesses and our entire city. We spent $11 trillion fighting COVID. It is time for us to realize that this is a resilient city and a resilient country. We must reopen our city and we can do that. And so you and the governor and I are sending a clear message to New Yorkers and into, into to this entire country that we are together to fight this real battle we have. Two clear messages we're saying loud and clear. Your children are safer in school. The numbers speak for themselves. And we are united to make sure that they will continue to be safe. And I'm a parent. I know what it is. And I think about Jordan and how much I want him to be safe. That's the investment I made in a lifetime. But back in school, we'll ensure our children are in a safe place and in a real way. So let me repeat the facts that the mayor laid out. The virus positively rate in city school is low. That is a fact. Because of precautionary measures in schools, such as masking and staff vaccinations, fewer than 1% of those exposed to COVID in schools contract the virus. That is such a safe thought to have. Our children are going to be safe. And as he just stated, 98% of close contacts in school don't turn into positive case. Case. We fight fear with that. What this mayor has done, and we will continue. Now, does that mean we should let down our guard? Absolutely not. Cases will continue to increase following the holiday, and we must remain as vigilant as ever. So, we will also double test in the schools. Smart decision. This way, we can identify those who are impacted by COVID and distribute, as the, gov as the governor mentioned, millions of tests to staff and parents to test at home. This is a new way of thinking. Let's get those test kits at home so parents can start taking precautionary steps and testing of their family members. At the same time, we will also increase testing capacity citywide to make it easier for young people to get checked and provide free vaccination at sites around the city. We're meeting a surge in the virus with a surge in resources because testing and vaccinations are how we beat COVID. There is no other greater way of winning this battle and opening our city by testing and vaccination. We saw it with Delta and now we're seeing it seeing with Omicron. You are most likely to get sick or hospitalized from any COVID variant including this variant, if you are not vac vaccinated. Vaccination prevents serious illness and it prevents hospitalization. Those are the winners that we're looking for. And so we cannot say it enough, testing and vaccination. And when it comes to school, our young people, it is critical that education is part of their overall, overall development, their mental health, their social skills, and in some cases, even personal safety. And they are able to learn better when they are in an in-person environment. So it's the city's job, our job, to keep schools safe and open and to provide as much testing and vaccine capacity as we can so that we can go to do our jobs, live our lives, and make sure our children continue to thrive. And so to the mayor of the city of New York and to the governor of this state, I cannot tell you enough how I appreciate the collaboration that we have shown during these difficult times. This is what makes us great as a city. We witnessed this during the 9-11 attacks and terrorism, and we're seeing it once again, how New York is showing the country how to deal with the crises. COVID is not terrorism, but it has brought terror. And the only way we can come back from this and get our city back open and thriving is for us to unite once again. And I'm ready to do so. And Mayor, again, I cannot thank you enough for the leadership you have shown. Thank you very much. Thank you, my dear friend and Mayor-elect. I got to tell you, uh, your message is so clear, so sharp to all New Yorkers. And I thank you for that. Uh, people are hearing the kind of leadership you're going to provide in the months and years ahead. And we need it. And I want to also say to you, every single conversation we've had, you always invoke what the data and the science tell us, what the healthcare leadership tells us. Those are your North Stars, and I want to thank you for that because we're in a country right now where there's a whole debate over the value of science, but I know you value it, and it guides your decisions. And I want to thank you for 
for that and the partnership and everything we've done today to make sure our kids will be safe. Thank you so much. Thank you. Everyone, I want you to hear from uh, a real powerful voice who has been uh, throughout the COVID uh, pandemic talking about the things we need to do to fight back and looking at it from a global perspective. And again, talk about how we need to be led by the data and the science, um, particularly when it comes to our schools and our kids. Uh, he is a chair of global health at the University of Edinburgh. It is my great pleasure to present to you Dr. Devi Sridhar. Hi, good morning, and thank you for having me here. Um, our research team in Edinburgh has been working for almost the past two years on schools, looking at international practice, best practice on this, and how to keep schools open for in-person learning. At the start of the pandemic, there were four considerations with schools. The first was the occupational risk to teachers and school staff of being in schools um, with children. The second was to the families and grandparents, maybe vulnerable members of families of having kids mixing in that environment. The third was the risk to children themselves. And finally, how schools might affect exponential growth with an infectious disease. The fantastic news with science is that we have had breakthroughs, which means we are in a different position now with schools than we were at the start. As we've heard from, you know, over the past half an hour, vaccines have absolutely transformed the landscape. We know, especially with boosters and even with Omicron, that these protect against severe disease. And for those parents who are worried, what does this mean for our kids? All the vaccine does is train your child's body on what the virus would be like when they're exposed to it so that their body knows how to fight it off. And with Omicron, it is so infectious that it is likely that over the next six to 12 months, most people will be exposed to this unless you absolutely isolate yourself away in a room. It is that infectious. And we are seeing that now in Britain as the rates take off. So right now with the tools that we have, vaccines, testing, we have been doing lateral flow testing, rapid antigen testing in Britain over the past year to keep schools open twice a week as a way to keep kids in classrooms. Again, really um, um, effective at catching infectious individuals and making sure they don't pass it on to others, as well as ventilation, making sure that there's clean air and masks. You have a pretty robust set of tools to keep kids in classrooms. The final point I'll make is we have also learned in the past two years the harms of children being out of school. And this is not just the educational inequalities. It is also things like you know, children not being fed properly, not being having heating, not having access to safe spaces and adults who are trained in um, you know, working with children. And so I think we have to use all the tools we have to keep schools open, and there is a way to do it now safely. Thank you very much. Doctor, thank you. Um, it's so important uh, for parents to hear voices like yours, uh, leading experts who really have studied this so carefully, and the reassurance is so much more powerful when it comes from a voice of expertise like yours. And doctor, um, I think just one more thing. You, we all understand parents' hesitation, but the fact that children benefit so much from being in school in so many ways, um, and, and that we have to factor that into equation. I just wanted to offer if you had any thoughts on that, because you know, sometimes the conversation gets a little one-dimensional. And what we've tried to think about is keeping kids safe in general, but also everything about their development, their needs. I just wanted to hear if there's anything you'd like to add on that. Oh, definitely. So school is not just about literacy and numeracy. It is about mental health. It is about social and emotional development. It is about being able to have a routine and structure to your day. And what we're increasingly seeing is that pediatricians are more concerned about non-COVID related issues now, mental health issues among adolescents, um, you know, children who are maybe older on and don't know how to hold a fork and a spoon or are not toilet trained because they haven't had that, you know, um, help from outside the household. And so kind of, I guess the message is that, you know, schools with all the measures we have now are safe, especially if your child is vaccinated, they will be better off in life in terms of the next five, 10, 20 years having that experience and that virtual learning cannot compensate for what it is like to be in an in-person classroom. And that is the clear message that I think all countries are realizing now and trying to move towards using the tools such as vaccines, testing, masks, ventilation, which together mean you can actually run learning in quite a safe way. 
Doctor, that's so powerfully said and so clear, and uh, we need clarity in this moment in history. So thank you for your leadership. Thank you for all you're doing to help people understand the right way forward. And, and your clear voice, uh, I think, is going to be very, very reassuring to a lot of parents in this city. Uh, so to everyone, uh, thank you to you and everyone in Edinburgh for sharing with us today a little reassurance for our parents. Very much appreciated, doctor. Thank you. And now I want you to hear from the city's doctor. Uh, and I will note, as I turn to uh, Dr. Dave Choksi, that not only uh, is he a parent, uh, he also happens to be uh, married to an educator. So he, when he thinks about schools, he thinks about it very, very personally, very humanly. And he's led by the data and the science, but he always thinks about the human angle as well. My pleasure to introduce our doctor, Dr. Dave Choksi. Thank you, as always, Mr. Mayor. Since September, we've described a dual mission for New York City's children, to keep schools safe and to prioritize in-person learning for kids. Uh, this is perhaps best articulated by the American Academy of Pediatrics, which has said policy considerations for school COVID-19 plans should start with the goal of keeping students safe and physically present. Today's Stay Safe, Stay Open plan reaffirms that dual mission as we return to school in the new year, even as we do make some adjustments due to Omicron. And as a father myself, let me say that I know parents are concerned about their kids' safety, especially during this Omicron wave. Uh, there's simply nothing more important than that. Uh, so to describe the plan further, uh, let me start with the science. What we know from our data over the school year is that schools remain among the safest settings in our communities. An epidemiologic measure known as the secondary attack rate helps us look at how likely it is that a person with COVID-19 in school transmits it to other students or staff. For any case identified in a New York City public school between October to December, only one in 120 close contacts developed COVID-19. That's 0.83%. When we compare that to the rate outside of schools, it's about one in seven contacts in a household who develop COVID-19, or over 14%. This market reduction in risk makes sense. As Mayor-elect Adams said, it is the result of the layered prevention measures we put in place like vaccination, testing, ventilation, distancing, and kids staying home if they're feeling ill. And even if the rates were to become somewhat higher due to Omicron becoming dominant, we estimate that in schools, about 98% of close contacts do not end up developing COVID-19. So the Stay Safe, Stay Open plan revolves around more quickly identifying those cases, the 2%, and ensuring that they are isolating while keeping the other 98% of kids in school. We will do this by significantly scaling up our testing while adjusting our classroom quarantine policies. As the mayor has said, we will double our surveillance testing overall and include vaccinated individuals in that testing. We will distribute rapid test kits at a mass scale, both around cases identified in classrooms as well as to staff. And we will encourage wide testing of students and staff ahead of the first day of school through our community sites. Meanwhile, the Situation Room will shift from its current contact tracing protocols to supporting school leaders with these ramped up testing efforts. Our disease detectives will continue to investigate when there's evidence of widespread in school transmission like when there is an unusually high number of cases within a classroom or uh, with a sports team. And we will continue to strengthen our prevention measures at every opportunity, from distributing high quality masks to further improving ventilation, with a particular emphasis on vaccination, especially for five to 11 year olds, as well as boosters for anyone 16 and older. The bottom line is that schools are not just among the safest places for our kids to be. They're also health promoting environments, as Professor Sridhar pointed out. And remote learning is not just detrimental educationally, it also exacerbates health inequities and has worsened youth mental health. 
Schools nourish our children's brains and their bodies. That's why we're so committed to keeping them safe and keeping them open. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much, doctor. And now everyone, I want you to hear from a public school parent because all the healthcare leaders have uh, so much that's important to say, obviously all the public officials, but I want you to hear from a parent uh, what it feels to him about the importance of this action to keep us safe, keep our kids safe. He's a father of a fourth grader and a fifth grader. Go to PS 304 in the Bronx. Uh, he's a soccer coach for his kids, uh, committed to uh, the community and the school. My pleasure to welcome Fabian Wonder. Thank you so much, Mayor de Blasio. Uh, my name is Fabian Wander. As uh, the mayor stated, I am a proud father of two boys in New York City Public School at PS 304 in the Bronx. Anderson, who's a fourth grader, and Alexander, a fifth grader. When I served on my local community education council, I heard from parents whose number one concern was keeping their children and their families safe, but knew their kids belonged in school with their friends, caring teachers, and in-person supports. Today's announcement balances those priorities, making sure that we keep as many students in school as safely as possible. Like all New York parents, we navigated the past two years of uncertainty as a family, supporting and helping each other thrive regardless if we were in remote or hybrid learning environments. Still, with all of that uncertainty, it was very hard on working families like mine. I was so happy that our schools fully opened this fall. I remember my wife and I feeling fearful on that first day that our kids returned to school when the schools first transitioned and the students were allowed back. The moment we picked up our kids from school that day and witnessed how happy and excited they were to be back in the school building, we knew we made the right decision. Academically, PS304 has gave my boys a high quality learning experience, regardless of whether instructions were remote or in person, but still being fully in person meant that they're with their friends and educators who were able to support them and give them the full attention that they surely deserve. The difference was not subtle. I can see it right away. As a clinical social worker myself, I've seen the psychological impact school closures and isolations has on our children. When you think about the health effects of COVID-19, we must equally consider the impact isolation has on young people's emotional wellness, something we've only just started to grapple with. We cannot continue to live in constant fear. This isn't a healthy option for us. We need to power through this and move forward. We cannot go back. We cannot go back to isolation remote learning, and keeping our children from everything they love. With smart, flexible testing policies and safety protocols in place, we can keep our kids in school with caring adults, helping them regain everything that this pandemic took from them. Thank you, Mayor de Blasio. Thank you, Fabian. Really powerfully said, and thank you for all you do for the school community, for our kids, and thank you for speaking up on how important it is to keep them in school. Really appreciate you. All right, now everyone, we've talked obviously about how crucial our schools are for our kids, for our families, also crucial to bringing this city back fully and putting the COVID era behind us. Now I wanna shift our focus to another part of our recovery. I always talk about recovery for all of us. Recovery for all of us means making the city safer and safer. We are the safest big city in America, but we have more to do. And what we've learned over these last eight years is that the best solutions occur at the community level. And this is really a sea change in thinking uh, in terms of public safety. There's been a sea change of thinking in policing and in the NYPD. There's been a sea change in terms of understanding across all of the five boroughs uh, how important community-based solutions to violence are how important community leadership is, community involvement is. This is a new model that must be deepened because it is the future. Uh, we understood at the beginning of this administration that uh, something was happening that was powerful. We saw the work of the Cure Violence Movement and it was brought together and formalized as a crisis management system in 2014. And that is a historical moment that has really not been fully recognized enough. 
Uh, we want to, in one of our uh, last press conferences in this administration, talk about this powerful model and how it must grow further in New York City, but also all over this country. Because we found that true public safety uh, requires deep community involvement, and certainly with neighborhood policing, the bond between police and community. But also true public safety requires community-based solutions. Uh, they are absolutely indispensable. And that means investing in efforts at the community le level, led by community members with real ownership by the community, uh, to find their own solutions. Uh, these investments are absolutely necessary, and we've got to build on them. Uh, what violence interrupters do, and I think uh, New Yorkers have some sense of it, but I really hope this becomes more and more of the discussion in this city. What violence interrupters do is incredibly noble. It's very hard work, it's very powerful work, and it makes a difference. De-escalating conflicts, uh, stopping violence before it happens, steering young people in positive paths. Uh, it was crucial to me that we document this and that uh, we make sure uh, that New Yorkers got to see the fullness of this movement it has grown over time. Our mayor's office for criminal justice has uh, led the way, providing support and funding for these incredible community solutions. And we wanted uh, to present uh, to New Yorkers what's happening in a compelling way. And uh, a good young man came along and volunteered his time and energy. And as he got to know the work of the violence interrupters, it became a passion for him uh, to make sure that this, this vision is shown to the people of this city. Uh, so I say now with tremendous pride, uh, I have the opportunity to introduce this good young man who took it upon himself to capture what this movement is all about. And I am very proud to welcome to our press conference, Dante de Blasio. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I had this incredible opportunity over the past few months to speak to violence interrupters. Uh, some of you might not know what that means. Violence interrupters are street outreach workers who do everything from de-escalating violent situations, talking about two guys you know, with knives who might be about to start a fight and talking them down, calming them down, you know, and much less dramatic situations as well, uh, offering job services to a young man who might get recruited into a gang because he needs money, making sure that he has a place, uh, that he has opportunities. And as I spoke with violence interrupters, people like Aisha Sekou, Mike Perry, Erica Ford, you know, I was just so struck by their tenacity in the face of adversity. Every single one of them has either witnessed gun violence, lost a family member to it, lost a friend to it, and yet they still do this incredibly difficult and at times dangerous work because they want to create a safer New York City. And I mean, I was so inspired by their example and it felt necessary to highlight their work through a series of videos, a series of profiles. And I was also really struck by some conversations I had with police officers about the work of violence interrupters. They often are able to work together. Um, and I find that many police officers are appreciative of the work of violence interrupters because they are doing preventative services. They are trying to make sure that acts of violence don't occur in the first place so that police don't have to react to them. And I think the model for that kind of collaboration is uh, Inspector Terrell Anderson, who works in the 73rd Precinct, and who we had a chance to make a video on. Uh, his whole thing is the Brownsville Safety Alliance, which is a collaboration between violence interrupters, community-based organizations, and the PD. And they've just done some incredible work in Brownsville. So I think we're going to show a very short video next, uh, a bit of a trailer for this series that will briefly explain the concept of a violence interrupter, and we'll show our subjects. Thank you. The violence interrupter model is designed to do three things. The first is to interrupt, de-escalate conflicts on the spot. The second is to identify those high-risk young people engaged in violent activities and guide them towards a peaceful path. The third is to mobilize the community to reject the violence. We give young people the tools that they need to be successful in life. The therapeutic services, the job program, the in-school program, the hospital work. For us to cure is credible messengers. Individuals from these very neighborhoods, people who can show up in the hood at 2 o'clock in the morning and counter someone pointing a gun at someone and get them to put the gun down. Uh, 
I love that. And Dante, let's first of all make clear to all New Yorkers, how are people going to be able to see these videos? Yes, these videos can be found at nyc.gov slash neighborhood safety. And for you personally, um, I think you had heard a little bit about this movement and then you experienced it. What did it make you feel like? What change occurred in you in terms of your understanding of what the future could bring, how we keep people safe? Definitely. I mean, going to these people's neighborhoods, going around you know, all sorts of places in New York City and seeing the, the daily work that they were doing to create a sustainable peace in their neighborhoods, I mean, it was just incredible. I mean, it's so often to get pessimistic when it comes to crime, when it comes to government in general. You know, a lot of people don't really believe that there are people like this out in the streets every single day trying to create a better city, but they're out there and they're doing incredible work. Did it surprise you sometimes? Oh, definitely. And I mean, in some very sad ways too. I mean, I spoke about this a little bit earlier, how, how much violence, how much pain there is uh, that a lot of these violence interrupters have experienced, and yet they still do this incredible work. You know, they still are out there every single day. And no, it's just a wonderful thing that the city's been investing in, and I think this is a model for the rest of the nation, honestly. Amen. Amen. Well, your perfect segue. Thank you. Because, in fact, um, the investments are growing. Uh, and this is so important to recognize. And Dante, thank you. Thank you for what you did here because we gotta get the word out about this. We gotta get the word out and um, making it visual, making it powerful to people is gonna help. So thank you for your good work. Everyone, the investments in the crisis management system, cure violence movement, the violence interrupters, I am telling you this is some of the best money we will ever spend because it is profound, the impact is being made. And to pick up on Dante's point, it is an impact that grows and grows and grows because lives get turned around and those folks become agents of peace as well. So since the crisis management system was established in 2014, uh, the city's invested over $300 million in over 40 community organizations doing this extraordinary work. Uh, the focus has been on the precincts with the highest gun violence, so it's really been targeted where the need is greatest. Uh, today, I'm very proud to announce uh, that the federal government is recognizing the extraordinary work of organizations here in New York City. Some of the organizations that are now going to benefit from federal support as well are here with us today. Uh, today, we're announcing $20 million in funding from the uh, Biden administration. And this was part of a competitive nationwide grant application. New York City is the second jurisdiction in this country to win this award because of the extraordinary work being done here. Also the groundbreaking work. This is a movement that's growing and evolving. Some of the best and most creative work is happening here in New York City. And that's a credit to all the members of uh, the crisis management system, the Cure Violence Movement. Special thanks also to uh, those in city government who, for whom this has been a labor of love. Uh, and they have put their heart and soul into building this in these recent years. Many people should be thanked. Uh, but I want to thank our director of the Mayor's Office of Criminal Justice, uh, Marcos Soler, uh, from City Hall, from our team, Freya uh, Rigterink, who's done uh, really, I'm sorry, Rig, I never get the name right. Rigterink, who has done great, great work uh, building this effort. Uh, Eric Cumberbatch, who's been working with organizations across the community, Jessica Mofield, and Tahira Moore, among many others who have been deeply, deeply committed. Um, Today, we're also focusing on the formalization, the, the permanent status of the Office for Neighborhood Safety, which will be um, a real powerful element in city government focusing on these solutions and supporting them. So we are honoring the folks who do the work. We're honoring them with investments. We're honoring them by showing the people of the city what it means, how it works, how powerful it is. And today we also gathered uh, some of the members of this extraordinary movement to thank them and honor them. Uh, you're going to hear from uh, one of the leaders of this movement, one of the originals, one of the earliest leaders of this movement. But here today representing a variety of partners, and I want to hasten to add, as I said, we have over 40 plus partners we've invested in. This is just a few of the outstanding groups are represented here today, but it was important uh, to thank uh, some of the groups to be able to thank all of the groups. 
So from uh, Bronx Connect, release the grip, uh, Tara Brown is here. Uh, from Getting Out, Staying Out, Stand Against Violence, East Harlem, Save, Quincy Lasseter. From Operation Hood, Coney Island, sponsored by the Jewish Community Council of Coney Island, Tyron Teres. And from Man Up uh, in Brooklyn, A.T. Mitchell. Uh, these groups will be benefiting from this new federal funding. And uh, it is so important that that federal support is going to turn into lives saved here in this city. So uh, first, I want to uh, give my recognition as mayor to the people who make the crisis management system work every day. And we're going to uh, present a proclamation to the folks who have come here and really do this amazing work in the community. Everyone come on up. I want to just say to everyone, thank you from the bottom of my heart. Amazing work you do. Uh, you've, too often you've been unsung heroes. We are singing you today. We are singing your praises, giving our appreciation on behalf of the people of New York City. Are you live streaming? <laughs> the, uh, we'll give you, we'll give you a copy. <laughs> no. But to everyone, you're doing priceless work, uh, sacred work, and it's making a huge difference. And please share with all the members of this movement uh, the deep thanks of the people of this city. I have the honor of representing all 8.8 .8 million at this moment in thanking you and on behalf of the people of this city declaring today Crisis Management System CMS Day in the city of New York. Please. Thank you. God bless you all for the work you do. Thank you. And I want everyone to hear from, as I said, one of the originals, one of the founders. Can I stay put behind me or not? Please. You can, you can, yeah, you can. You can have the coalition around you. Yes, thank you. Uh, he is the founder and CEO of Man Up, uh, one of the architects of the New York City crisis management system. And I've gotten to know him over the years. This is, this is one of the New Yorkers I've come to have a powerful trust in because he lives his values and he has lived the entire experience he's trying to address. And he's doing it with a heart and soul and he's making a huge impact. He is literally saving lives. My pleasure to introduce a very good man, A.T. Mitchell. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor Bill de Blasio. Good morning, New York City. Um, today, you know, we, as you mentioned, we've made history again. You know, we stand here today as Crisis Management System Day here in New York City, and we're very proud. So on behalf of all of the Crisis Management System, the Care Violence Global, and the Fun Peace Partnership here in New York City, I just want to say thank you, you know, to you, uh, to your administration, to the Mayor's Office of Criminal Justice, with Marcos Soler, and of course, Eric Cumberbatch and, and Jessica Mofield and their team, we are really appreciative of just being honored. We also want to uh, say very, you know, thank you to all of the city council members who represent the districts that we all work within. Because without their support, without their dedication to us, we would also not be here today. So thank you to all the elected officials who's also played a key role um, from the beginning. I also just want to publicly thank all of my other brothers and sister comrades of this work here in New York and across the, the country. Those of us that have our boots on the ground day in and day out. Uh, we put our lives on the line and as has been said, oftentimes our work goes unnoticed. But today I think it's a good day because now we can honestly, honestly say that we are being recognized uh, on the highest level, respectfully. So thank you to all of the brothers and sister comrades of the different organizations that are out there doing this work. Um, we have many titles. As you know, the Violence Interrupt is a title. The Outreach Source Worker is a title. But you know, we're all like, I think we stand under what we call a credible messenger movement. You know, and so we really want to appreciate you and we hope that you continue to keep up the good work of, at keeping this city a safe and a healthier place for everybody to live. You know, prior to this administration, Mayor, 
we and other comrades, as you know, some of my other co-leaders, we oftentimes made our way here to City Hall with caskets representing you know, the, life, the lives that were lost on behalf of the families of the victims of violence. And we came and we, as advocates, we, we demanded that this city would pay attention. And today, I can honestly say that this city and this administration has recognized us. Not only have you continuously invited us into City Hall, uh, into Gracie Mansion, um, into the meetings uh, and sat at the tables, you've come out to our communities, You've walked the streets with us. Your team have been constantly being in contact. You've helped us administer the monies and get the funding on the ground. And that's unheard of. You have changed the game here in New York. Under your administration, as you mentioned, we have became the largest kill violence global replication site in the world. And we are very, very appreciative of that and hope that you will add this to your legacy because you took a chance on us when no one else did. And you had faith in us. And, and hopefully we delivered our part of it. You know, like you said, a lot of our work goes unnoticed because these men and women, they do it from their hearts. And data is important, but we don't oftentimes capture all the data yet. But today's evidence is that the voices that we used to holler and scream at the building has been heard. We're here today because now the federal government and other levels of government are pouring support into our work. And so that means that our voices have been heard. You know, uh, I just want to conclude by saying that we are very optimistic and we're very excited about the new administration that's coming in um, because they have some very big shoes to fill. And we're very confident that they will continue under the new mayor's administration to support our work because we still have more work to do. We are only right now, we're still only working eight hours out of the day, you know, and any other emergency response team needs to be 24 hours and seven days a week. And with that type of support, um, we will feel more confident with more men and women like ourselves on the ground that we can bring down the gun violence in our city and again, make our city the biggest, safest city in the world. Thank you. Thank you. And I got to say, A.T., um, I just, I really, really admire the leadership you provided. Thank you, sir. And um, I, I want to say that um, it is always striking to me when there are these successes, um, how there isn't enough sort of time taken to pay attention to them. Remember on Juve this year, yes, sir. And, the, and, and there have been historic challenges, and this year there was not a single incident. That's absolutely and that was because the crisis management system, Cure Violence Movement, deep, deep involvement that day to make that joyous celebration a safe one as well. That was a triumph, and that was a model. I want to offer, I want to ask you two things. One, if there's one thing you could say, because you have the floor, if there's one thing you could say to help New Yorkers across all communities understand why this is so important, something you feel that has been missed in understanding this movement. Mm -hmm. What would you like to tell people? Well, I, I think that the one thing that has been missed is that we've been oftentimes misunderstood. You know, this is the first time that our type of community representation has had opportunity to play a key role in, 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 in government and in, in public safety. Um, a lot of times people do not understand that our work it's very intricate and very, it's very dangerous. And, and a lot of the work that we do is based on our credibility. And so that's something that we cannot compromise. It's the safety of in, our men and women who go out there with their credibility. But if you really look in between the lines, now you have a whole city of, of, of people who understand their purpose, they understand their part, and we're doing it. And as long as we are allowed to do it and do it the way that we know how to do it best, I think that at the end of the day, the whole city benefits, you know, and at, as your son mentioned, you know, the, the lives that are saved in between, the, the fights that we intervene and interrupt, that's something that everybody doesn't, you know, it shouldn't be for any and everybody to do. And, and the last thing I think is important that people know is that these men and women are professionals, that they're trained, they're well-trained individuals. They're not just black and brown bodies that are in t-shirts or in, in, in sweatshirts on, on hot spots in, 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 in the city. These men and women are very well trained 
and professional at the work that they do. And so I think that's important that people understand who we are. And I have seen it, I want to testify, I've seen the professionalism, the commitment, the extraordinary effort. Um, I, I want people to get to know it. And that leads to my second point, I want you to be film reviewer. How, how did this young man do? That was, a, that was a fine piece, young man. I mean, I'm very impressed. Thank you so much for even you adding your contribution to it because, again, a lot of our work goes uncaptured. And so we appreciate your contribution. You did a fine job. That was a very nice snippet. And you're going to see more. Looking forward And the to whole it. city is going to see more. And Dante, you've done good. Well, thank you. I'm glad. <laughs> thank, you. thank you for spreading the message that needs to be spread. And it's going to help a lot of people be safe. Everyone, thank you. God bless thank you. you. Likewise. Thank you. God bless you. Happy and safe New Year. Yes, sir. Likewise. All right. Got a few more things to do here, and they're, they're good things. So talk about getting at truths and helping people understand things that maybe weren't given the attention they deserve. Well, we made a a very solemn promise in 2020, last year, to address in a new way some of the inequalities in our society, and particularly the structural ones, structural and institutional racism has plagued this city for generations upon generations. And to do that, we thought it was important to create a brand new model, a racial justice commission. Pattern on some of the commissions around the world after major conflicts, truth and reconciliation commissions, different models existed. We wanted to create one here in this city to look at some of the history and some of the truth that had to be uncovered and addressed formally, officially by the city government, but also acted on and how we would build new models for the future. A positive vision because by acknowledging the pain of the past, you can also move past it productively and get to solutions that actually change society and address these underlying structural realities. I want to give a special thanks to Deputy Mayor Phil Thompson, uh, who, for whom this has been a labor of love, this work, and has done it for uh, decades in different ways, but played a very powerful role uh, with this commission. Uh, a special thanks, of course, to the chair, Jennifer Jones Austin, who's contributed immeasurably to this city uh, in this role and so many others and the vice chair, Henry Garrido, who brought a wealth of wisdom and experience to the process and heart. Uh, the commissioners, the folks that I named put their entire heart and soul for months and months. They went out and listened to the people of the city. They looked at the history. They listened to all the ideas. They came up with a clear path. And this was also a charter revision commission. So the idea was to look at the city's foundational document, the city charter, and update it. Start the process of bringing it into the 21st century and and weeding out uh, the structural racism within nine months of public engagement have led to today where the commission is submitting its ballot proposals that will be on the ballot in November uh, 2022. This includes creating a racial equity office for the city of New York that will look at literally all the work of government, continue to assess where there are gaps in terms of equity and where there are changes and, and new ideas that can be achieved. Uh, this is first in the nation. And I hope it becomes an example for the whole nation. Having this public conversation with an eye to change and solution is incredibly powerful. This is going to be on the ballot, as I said, in November coming up, November 2022. I'm going to urge all New Yorkers, pay attention to this. It's going to change this city for the better. Flip that ballot on Election Day in 2022 so you can support the incredible work of this commission. And right now, the chair of the commission, Jennifer Jones Austin, is walking the ballot proposals into the city clerk's office so they will be registered to go on the ballot, uh, the culminating act of the incredible work of this commission. Uh, Jennifer, I, I cannot thank you enough. You did incredible work, incredible hard work, groundbreaking work, nation-leading work on this commission. I, I believe we have a live feed from you from the clerk's office, and with great gratitude, <laughs> I send it over to you, Jennifer Jones Austin. Good morning. Good morning, Mayor de Blasio. No thanks needed over here from me. You had the vision, you had the courage, and you stood up this commission and appointed several of us to go forward and to do the work to begin to end structural racism here in New York City. 
in just a few minutes, I, along with my fellow commissioners and staff of the commission and some people who've gathered, New Yorkers, who've been a part of this effort from day one, are going to walk across the street to the city clerk's office and file three ballot proposals that lay the foundation for ending structural racism here in the city of New York. We're so honored, we're so humbled, we're proud New Yorkers, and we're so thankful that we've had this opportunity to serve in this way. Jennifer, you've done an absolutely amazing job, and uh, I, you just you keep finding new and new ways to move this city forward. And I, I know you and all your fellow commission members and the staff, proud New Yorkers, who believe we could make a difference, and you did. Thank you. God bless you. It's an amazing work. Thank you so much. Thank, thank you, you, thank you, thank you. So now just remember that New Yorkers are gonna have to come out and vote for these proposals. We've done the first part, but the hard work, which is not too hard, is for the New Yorkers on November 8th, 2022, to vote these initiatives, these ballots, into law. And so what we gotta do, we gotta make sure that everybody centers on our vote, our voice. Our Guys? Vote. Our vote. Our vote. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you. We got the message. Thank you. Well done, Jennifer. All right, now everybody, uh, as we conclude this press conference, I have the wonderful, wonderful joy of celebrating another great New Yorker. We've been doing this over these last few weeks, and it is making me prouder every single day of this city. Incredible people that have come out of the city and changed the world in so many ways. Uh, I want to talk about someone who uh, he has changed the world uh, with his incredible skill as an actor, uh, a director. Uh, he's changed the world as someone who gave back to the city. He loves and gave back to our first responders. But he also changed my world and my whole team's world because uh, when I was starting out, he's one of the people who uh, lent uh, not just a hand, but a tremendous support and kindness and encouragement and helped our whole team get here to City Hall and make an impact. And I'll talk about his achievements, but I think something especially fun to do would be to look back to the year 2014. We were getting ready for the Inner Circle show which I know our colleagues in the media look forward to coming back live uh, in 2022. It was the first one I was gonna do, and I had to get ready, because I'd never done an Inner Circle show. I had to get ready. I needed a great uh, drama coach. I needed someone who could prepare me for this grand performance. And this video you're gonna see captures Steve Buscemi uh, coaching me, preparing me uh, for hopefully acting greatness. Let's, let's look at this video. Niles, I am never gonna get this. No, it, uh, it looks great. You're... Zip it, Niles. Steve, what are you doing here? You are in crisis mode, my friend. Inner circle. Inner circle crisis mode. Coming up, Yeah. right? You wanna be in shape. It. We're doing great, Steve. We don't... What do you think got Dinkins to sing? What do you think got Bloomberg to dance? What do you think put Rudy in that dress? You? In a way. Right. Never mind. Come on, we got work to do. All right. Hands up. Right, hands are always moving. It's kind of improv, isn't it? Isn't yeah. It? Unique New York. Unique New York. Unique New York. Unique New York. Just try doing this. It might be helpful if you th think of yourself as an animal. Good. Let me see you do a monkey. He eats pizza with a knife and fork, and they call me a dummy? Okay, I'm seeing your lips move a lot. I'm as light as a feather. I'm as light as a feather. Can you go another 30? Yeah. Okay, now you lose the feather. I'm as light as a feather. A little higher. Yeah. Those municipal labor contracts you need to sign, Mr. Mayor? It's easy now, right? What? Niles, you're killing me here! I can't help it. I'm your mother. That was good. Really? Yes. He eats pizza. He eats pizza with a knife. He eats pizza with a knife and fork, uh -huh. and they call me a dummy? One <laughs> <laughs> well, of the all time greatest, Steve, amongst your many dramatic achievements. Um, this guy, I have to say, and this is the whole truth, uh, we live in the same neighborhood in Brooklyn. I knocked on his door one day when I was running for city council, 
And I, I didn't realize it was him <laughs> until he, he, he was standing in front of me. And that began in the most uh, wonderful of ways a friendship. Um, and I got to know Steve as a human being. A famous guy, yes, but I got to know him as a human being and a member of our neighborhood. And I got to know his story. And he started out uh, as someone who just was looking for a way forward in New York City, became a firefighter, engine company, 55, serving Little Italy in the 1980s. And his incredible talent emerged, and he became just one of the great actors of our time, an incredible storyteller. And you could think of him for the extraordinary comedic work he's done. You could think of him for Boardwalk Empire. Uh, and so many other, talk about range. Dude, but I have been moved by not only the friendship that I've experienced, but the love he feels for so many people in the city, and particularly for our first responders. After 9-11, he was there for people, felt a tremendous bond to our firefighters in particular. After Sandy, we walked together in Breezy Point, the devastation after Hurricane Sandy. You were there for that community. Uh, Steve, no matter uh, what you do, uh, how famous you become, you always come back uh, to your love for this place and your love for the people who serve us. And uh, I got to tell you, your, your heart, your soul, your feet are on the ground always. It has moved me every single time. And this is one of the last things I get to do as mayor. But it's sort of, I'm, this is talk about for all, full circle. I was so special the day I knocked on that door in 2001. Here we are 20 years later, brother. Yeah. Uh, it's been a long road for both of us, but I can't thank you enough for what you've done for this city. And it is my tremendous honor on behalf of the people of the city to present you to the key, with the key wow. to New York City. Wow. That's amazing. Thank you. Wow. Here it is. Uh, you, you should get it just for drama coaching. <laughs> okay. You know, you're a natural. I think you should. Really? Yeah. Yeah. Really? Yes, yes. Uh, I'm going to think about that. Some casting ideas. Yeah, OK. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, I did write some remarks. It'd only be about 40 minutes. <laughs> um, no, but I just want to say this is such an honor to, to be here with you today and to receive this, um, to have uh, friends and family here. Karen, thank you for being here today. My brothers, Michael and Kenneth. Um, yeah, we are New Yorkers. Our parents were both born uh, in Brooklyn, Bay Ridge, in East New York. Um, all my brothers live in New York City. We're spread out, Brooklyn, Manhattan, Staten Island. My mom is there, too. Uh, our dad was a sanitation worker for 30 years. Kenneth worked uh, for the MTA for 30 years. Michael, who is also a really fine actor, um, he's been in more New York City productions than I can count. And although he's not a politician, he is the unofficial mayor of Red Hook. Did you know that? That's pretty good. Just Mr. ask mayor. anybody on Van Brunt Street. They all know him. Um, New York City, uh, it's where I met my late wife, Jo Andres, who you know was an incredible filmmaker, painter, performance artist, and friend. Uh, we met when we were both living in the East Village back in the 80s, you know, doing performance work. We got married right here in City Hall. Uh, and when we had our son, Lucian, we moved to Park Slope, we became Bill's neighbor. Um, and we raised our son there. And he now lives in LA. You can't win them all. Oh, man. But every year. You just, his... just harshed our buzz. <laughs> <laughs> but every year on his birthday, I send him uh, a pizza from Luigi's in Sunset Park. And he eats it with his hands. He does not use a knife and fork. Just saying. Just saying. Um, <laughs> New York City is where I learned how to be an actor, you know, doing theater and independent film. You were kind enough to mention some of the productions. Just a little trivia point. One year in the late 80s, I had a very New York year. I appeared in the films New York Stories, King of New York, and Slaves of New York, not to mention Bloodhounds of Broadway. Did you see that one? <laughs> I, I, I missed right. that one. Come on, you got to keep up. <laughs> Um, but before being an actor, I had one of the greatest jobs in the city, as you know, at Engine 55 in Little Italy. And I'll always be grateful 
to them for allowing me to work beside them in the aftermath of 9-11. Um, this city has been through a lot over the years, and we've been through it together. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, we always get through it by working together um, and supporting each other. And that's one of the things I love most about this city is the people. You know, it's their energy, the passion, spirit, and love. And Bill, I want to thank you and Charlene and your whole administration for the dedicated service and the major accomplish accomplishments of the past eight years. And I do believe that the reforms and the initiatives that your, of your tenure it will benefit this city for years and years to come. And as a New Yorker, I'm, I'm grateful for that. And, you know, as New Yorkers, it's up to all of us, you know, to, to keep this city great and, and to make it a better place always. Um, when I was a kid, I would only see key to the city ceremonies, you know, on TV or in movies. And to think that now I'm in movies, but this is not a movie. This is real, right? This is real. This is real. This is actually happening. I'm getting the key to the city. If this was a movie, my character would not be getting a key to the city. <laughs> He'd be stealing the key to the city. <laughs> trying to make it work. <laughs> uh, anyway, this is just such an incredible honor. I never could have imagined in a million years that I would receive this honor and that one day I would count the city, the, the mayor of the city of New York as a friend. Thank you, brother. This means the world to me. And, uh, and thank you. Thank you to all. I appreciate it. Brother, you are you're all heart and soul. And uh, you do take some curious uh, choices of roles. Yes. OK, let, let's, say, let's say not every one of your characters is an admirable civic figure. OK. Although, <laughs> although Nucky is a very, very capable, let's say that. Civic-minded, you know. Yeah. But, well, okay. In his own way. Yes, yes. Um, but I wanted to say, um, something about you maintains an optimism. I've always noticed this. Uh, even though you play often characters who uh, maybe have tougher personas, you always have an optimism. And I wanted you to tell people, especially every, after everything we've been through these last couple of years, mm -hmm. what keeps you hopeful? Well, I mean, look, we are going through a tough time right now, and it's been this way, you know, for the last couple of years. Uh, but it really is, I, I think it's the people who are from here and who come here. You know, I always give a lot of credit uh, to people who come here from far away. Um, I mean, I was born in Brooklyn, but I was, you know, raised in Long Island. And that was like a world, that was worlds away. Coming into the city was so intimidating. But once you're here and you, uh, it's, it's the people. It's, it's the people that you meet and that help you along the way and that you get to help along the way. Um, that to me, that's, that's the spirit of New York City. And that's what I guess keeps me optimistic because I've seen us go through hard times. I remember, you know, I mean, pre 9-11, you know, we know what the city was like in the 60s and the 70s and we've come a long way and we still have a lot of work that has to be done, of course, there's, but that's, there's always work to be done here. And, um, but if we, you know, if we band together, I really believe that we could do anything. I love that, I love that. The, uh, all I can say is there's different ways of inspiring and every time just your humanity, your sense of just something good in people comes through. And it's real interesting. I think it creates this kind of virtuous loop because you send a signal to people that something's okay. Well, I'm glad if that's true. I mean, I'm just so, I, I'm so privileged to work with, you know, uh, our friend Nancy Carbone, who does yes. Friends of F Firefighters. You know, I feel like I just, you know, lend myself. It's like, th it's all these other people that are doing the great, the great work, you know, that ask me maybe to be a part of it. And so it's easy for me to step in and be supportive, but I really give it up to the people who are really doing it every day and, you know, to, to make people's lives better. Well, I will say, final point, you, you, there's a lot of ways you've made lives better, but sometimes it's just the sheer uh, 
uh, kind of comic insanity of some of the roles you've taken on. Mm -hmm. And I just want to make sure, because people know, of course, uh, a lot of your very famous works, but I want to make sure everyone goes back and looks at the role you played in Portlandia. Oh, Portland! I thought you were going to say um, Spy Kids, because you used to... Well, Spy Kids. Compliment me on that one line. That one? Okay, oh, go ahead. let's do both. Portlandia. No, no, I want to hear, no, this is good. Well, no, I'll, I'll, go, I'll go from the sacred to the profane. Okay. <laughs> the sacred is the line from Spy Kids, and I'm like, how did you end up in Spy Kids on top of everything else? Oh, and you are the kind of mad scientist who creates yeah. the miniature animals. Yeah. And I think I went with our kids. Yeah. So I'm watching the movie like, ah, here's a kid's movie. And the mad scientist looks off into space at one point, your character, and says, do you think... God stays in heaven because he fears what he's created here on earth. Yeah. And I just like, wait a minute. <laughs> you know, like that's a deep, that's a deep, deep line. So I have often quoted that back you, to you. Yeah, you said it to me, and I was like, oh, I did say that, didn't I? Yeah, <laughs> it's like, pretty amazing, yeah. powerful, yeah. deep meaning there. But the, from the sacred to the profane, Portlandia, yeah. where you played the, the spokesman and representative of the celery industry. Yes. I think that is one of your great unsung moments. Thank you so much. So I hope now Thank all you. the audience will go out and look up that segment. And I remember you were trying to, or I think it was, I think you were up against kale, and kale was the trendy thing, and celery was you know, going. Celery's nowhere. a tough sell. <laughs> it's a tough sell. <laughs> celery's you know, a tough sell. You have to be committed. Yeah. But people should, you know, Park Bench. You were, you know, you were, you were an early guest on Park Bench. I was. That, uh, we filmed here. Yes. And how about the Vampire Weekend spot that we did? This the was Vampire before, Weekend video. Before you which were was, there. That was that your first music video you directed? That was, yeah, yeah. That was I was, and I, yeah. you know. You met the boys and you yeah. inspired them, yes. It was my honor. <laughs> so you can see a rich cultural history here. <laughs> Everyone, um, I just, this is such a beautiful thing to be able to honor. People have done so much good. And Steve is just one of my all-time favorites, what he's done for the city and who he is. So, Steve Buscemi, God bless you. God bless you, brother. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. All right. Well, we'll finish up our, our work at hand here. I always find after we have the chance to honor someone, it's so moving and... Uh, Kind of feels funny to go back to things like our indicators, but let's go back to our indicators anyway. They still tell us so much about where we're at and what's going on. So, first of all, doses administered to date. Again, people keep coming up. Get those boosters, everyone. You have till Friday uh, to get that hundred dollar incentive. People are showing up. Thirteen million one hundred twenty-seven thousand one hundred eighty-seven doses to date. Second, daily number of people admitted to New York City hospitals for suspected COVID-19. Today's report, 332 patients. Uh, confirmed positivity level, 61.41%. Hospitalization rate per 100,000 people, 4.76. Very high, and yet, thank God, because of all the actions that have been taken, all the vaccination, uh, our hospitals are handling the situation well. And new reported cases, seven-day average, a figure we could never have imagined. We're, we're getting through it because people took the right precautions. 20,200 cases, just a staggering number, but one that hopefully will be very, very brief. A few words in Spanish, and this is about keeping our schools safe and the new measures we announced today. Nuestros hijos necesitan aprender en persona. Por eso vamos a hacer más pruebas de COVID en nuestras escuelas. Así es como hacemos que nuestras escuelas sean aún más seguras. With that, let's turn to our colleagues in the media, and please let me know the name and outlet of each journalist. We will now begin our Q&A. As a reminder, today we're joined by Deputy Mayor Phil Thompson, Marcus Soler, Mock J Director, Chancellor Misha Porter, Dr. Dave Choksi, Health Commissioner, Dr. Mitch Katz, President and CEO of New York City Health and Hospitals, and Dr. Ted Long, Executive Director of New York City Test and Trace. With that, we will go to our first question from Andrew from NBC. Good morning, Mr. Mayor. Hey, Andrew, how you doing, brother? Good, thanks. Uh, you must be feeling something with only four days to go on the job. So uh, I, I'd like to ask about the school testing. 
Um, and our understanding is that no children will be tested by the city or the schools before they come back, which is something that Brad Lander and Jamani Williams have called for. Um, you have said that that was a noble idea, but it just wasn't possible. So you're saying there was no consideration or effort to try and set up some kind of mass testing this weekend so kids can get tested before they come back to school. Uh, our health care leadership, uh, our education leadership, everyone looked at this. Uh, Andrew, we really came to a conclusion the approach we're taking that we announced today is the right way to go. Uh, schools have been incredibly safe. Uh, we want a, a smooth return to school. We want our kids in school. We want to make sure they're safe. We think this approach is the right way to do it. Go ahead, Andrew. Have you discussed and, and are you concerned that by limiting capacity in Times Square and by essentially saying uh, mandatory masks, mandatory vax, only 15,000, limit, 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 that perhaps unwittingly you're driving people to celebrate indoors, which is the most fertile place for Omicron to spread in the first place? How concerned are you that by scaling back Times Square, you're leading to bigger indoor gatherings? Andrew, it's a fair question, uh, and look, I think we had a couple of different things we were taking into account here. We're doing something um, that the eyes of the world are on and that is so important to this city um, that symbolizes us. We want to do it the very best way, and this is the right way to do it. We've been in a lot of consultation with our healthcare leadership, uh, with uh, the Times Square Alliance, figuring out what's that right balance point. Uh, this is a way of doing it that we're absolutely certain is safe and secure. We obviously want uh, anyone who's not attending um, to remember the basics. Dr. Choksi has spoken about them so many times that, you know, to, if you're going to celebrate, celebrate outdoors if you can, uh, social distancing, mask, but also especially vaccination. And, and those who are vaccinated, particularly those who get those boosters, have a very high level of protection. So, um, I think this is the right way to do this event, but it's, we know lots of people are going to be celebrating in other places, but the right way to do it, I think we've made really clear to folks. And again, anyone who hasn't gotten that booster, go get it now. Take advantage of the incentive up through the end of Friday. Next, we have Dave from ABC. Hi, Mayor. How are you? Good, Dave. How you feel? Hey, I, I'm fine. I just wanted to ask... Uh, and I hope this doesn't count as one of my two questions, but um, the mayor-elect, he's not there now. He's already no. gone on, I take it. No, he is not on at this point. So it does okay, not well, count as a question. Well, okay, we'll hear from him at 1.30. Okay, so my, my question is about, um, you know, we don't see Michael Mulgrew there, and it kind of begs the question as to whether schools really are the safest place for children to be. When you look at a couple of weeks ago when he had grave concern about tests not coming back in, a, in an expedient manner, and also that there were dozens and dozens of schools that had not been tested, he said, in a couple of weeks. So while it's good to go from, you know, 40,000 to 80,000 kids that are going to be tested each week, it kind of begs the question, is this really going to happen? Oh, absolutely. Um, and there's been incredible consistency in testing. I'll turn to uh, Dr. Choksi and Dr. Long, because I, I want to just be really clear about this. The, the testing has happened constantly. The results have been incredibly consistent. Uh, we made sure that the schools were literally the safest place in this city, uh, and we believe these additional measures are going to help us uh, continue that and deepen that. Uh, so yes, of course it's going to happen, and, and I want to give credit to our healthcare leadership and our education leadership and the folks in the Situation Room. Uh, folks said it couldn't be done. A lot of people said it couldn't be done, but it was. They, they brought back school. September 2020, brought back school, September 2021, full strength, made it safe, made it incredibly safe. Let's, let's look at that history. These folks really produce for all of us. Uh, Dr. Choksi, then uh, Dr. Long. Thank you very much, sir. And Dr. Long will speak to the Herculean efforts of test and trace in schools. But I'll just say briefly to start, uh, Dave, remember that there are um, three uh, layers of testing that we provide to help keep our school communities safer. Uh, the first is what you're referring to, which is uh, the PCR testing that is done uh, for surveillance purposes. Um, and the announcement today is that that will be doubled in the new school year. 
The second is all of the community testing sites uh, that we do as a city. Um, overall, our capacity is about 150,000 tests per day. And as we've uh, spoken about, we will continue to ramp that up uh, over the coming days. Uh, that's very important to keep in mind because uh, our uh, staff and students, um, everyone who's part of the school community also has access uh, to that community testing as well. And the third piece is what we are really adding at a massive scale uh, with the beginning of this new school year, which is rapid at home testing. Um, the supply for that, uh, as you know, has been constrained in prior weeks, but um, uh, but we're moving heaven and earth. I'm working with state partners and federal partners to get that supply uh, to be able to bring them to bear, particularly to support schools. Uh, with that, I'll, I'll hand it over to Dr. Long. Dr. Long. Thank you, Dr. Tuxi. Yeah, and Dave, I appreciate the question because our surveillance program in our schools has been one of the critical layers of protection. We've proven that our schools are one of the safest places to be and actually are safer than being in our communities. We're opening up 40 new testing sites across New York City this week, bringing our total of city run sites to more than 160 sites to make it as easy and accessible as ever for New Yorkers to get tested. And yes, we will be doubling the number of tests we're doing every week in our school, school surveillance program. And on top of that, bringing in millions of at-home tests to make sure our schools stay as safe as possible. Thank you. Thank you. Go ahead, Dave. Leads to my second question about the at-home test kits and how this will work. When there is a child who tests positive in a classroom, then all of the kids in that classroom will get an at-home kit. I love kids, but <laughs> they do have a tendency to lose things when they go home. Um, so is it incumbent upon the children to take these kits back trusting that they're going to do that and that the parents will see to it also? Now, that's a fair question, Dave. I mean, obviously, you know, we want to make sure every parent uh, gets what they need. And, you know, I will say as someone who was a New York City public school parent, I, I do think kids are pretty good about bringing home in their, their backpack whatever is given to them by the school. But we'll make them available to parents if they want to come to the school. And obviously, we can do that in other ways as well. Um, I think the good news is we're going to have a supply now that's going to uh, give us that freedom to do this uh, in various ways. So uh, we're going to work with every school community, and I'll, I'll turn to the chancellor because she can weigh in on this. We want to make sure uh, every school community is communicating with parents uh, that uh, when they need those kits, if for any reason there's a problem, we're going to work with them. Uh, to get it. That, remember, I think one of the things, Dave, that's gotten a little left out here in the whole dialogue is school communities are very, very engaged places. Uh, principals, assistant principals, uh, parent coordinators, teachers, they're talking to parents all the time. And if there's anything that needs to be clarified or resolved, there's lots of ways to engage parents to get that done. Chancellor, you want to weigh in on that? Sure. I, I agree with you 100%. School communities are going to make sure families know that a test kit is coming home if it's going home in a backpack, um, but we'll also make them available. Those lines of communication are way open, and I say don't es underestimate our young people. They know how important this moment is. They know how important testing is, and even our youngest learners, our three-year-olds, our four-year-olds, our five-year-olds, our second graders, third graders, our youngest learners know how important this moment is, and so I'm confident those test kits will get home, will be used appropriately, and if we need to work more directly with parents, we will. Amen. Go ahead. Next, we have Steve from WCBS 880. Hello, Mr. Mayor. How are you today? Good, Steve. How you been? I am well. Uh, wanted to ask first about uh, consent forms. I know you mentioned it towards the top that you're, there's an effort to try and get more of them in here. So I wanted to see what that effort's going to look like, what is going to be tried now that didn't work the first time, and, and if there's any thought to uh, asking parents to opt out of testing instead of opting in, as incoming controller Lander is suggesting. Well, two very different questions. Um, I think, first of all, on the consent forms, we've actually seen you know, a very substantial number of parents agree to the testing, and I think now that we're going to include the vaccinated kids, I think that number is going to jump up. Um, a lot of those parents, I think, are going to be absolutely willing to have their kids uh, tested. So I, I think we're going to have plenty of consent forms given uh, what we need. 
Um, but I think this approach, I'll turn to Dr. Choksi, I think this approach that we've created here is it's straightforward, uh, it's clear, it's a way to maximize keeping kids in school and doing it safely. I mean, there's lots of, lots of ideas out there. I appreciate all the elected officials who are putting forward ideas, but I want to give credit to both the educators on the team, the chancellor and all the educators, and the healthcare leadership, uh, so many of whom are with us today, they put their minds together and they said, what's going to work both from a data and science perspective, a health perspective, uh, education you know, perspective, what's gonna bring all these things together in a clear, straightforward plan? They came up with this, and I think it is the best way to proceed. Dr. Choksi, you wanna weigh in? Uh, thank you, sir. Just briefly to say that, uh, you know, this, um, this change to be able to incorporate uh, vaccinated students in our surveillance testing uh, was a marriage of, of what you talked about, uh, essentially the um, you know, the evolving science as we're seeing uh, Omicron and uh, how transmissible it is, along with what um, our colleagues at, at DOE, um, the chancellor and uh, all of her staff were hearing uh, from parents in terms of, of wanting to ensure that um, there was a broader uh, group of kids who were able to get tested. Uh, and so that's why, you know, we have made this adjustment in how uh, the PCR testing in schools will occur, will occur going forward. Um, it is, uh, I think, a very reasonable point that we need to maximize uh, consent. And I know uh, our colleagues at the Department of Education have worked very hard on that over the last several months. And we have a chance to redouble those efforts and get as many consents back as possible ahead of, of uh, bringing kids back to school. Thank you. Thank you. Go ahead, Steve. Thanks very much. And was also struck by something Dr. Choksi said earlier about the uh, changing focus of the situation room here. Uh, going from contact tracing to only looking at widespread outbreaks here. Is that an indication that uh, some amount of cases and, and maybe limited spread is inevitable here and that things got uh, somewhat overwhelmed in the situation room over the past couple of weeks? Well, no, I actually think it is a recognition of what we're experiencing with Omicron um, because we did not know what its nature would be fully in New York City, the experience we've had till we actually in the middle of it. And what we're finding is something that has been fast and intense, but obviously, thank God, to date, more mild than uh, we feared, and we're very happy about that. Um, and also, you see everything uh, changing. I'll, I'll bring Dr. Choksi in again. I, the, Steve, look at the CDC, the way they've re-estimated now the... Um, isolation period, the quarantine period, I think the science is evolving and the uh, strategies are evolving with the science, with the data. And that's what has happened here. Dr. Chox, you want to add? Yes, that's exactly right, sir. Um, and Steve, I would say that uh, the, the characterization of the changes to the situation room um, is not correct uh, in the way that you described. Um, the Situation Room uh, will continue to play a number of important functions beyond that role of monitoring for widespread transmission. Uh, it will continue to answer questions from school leaders, for example. It will support uh, school communication, for example, the letters to families that the Department of Education uh, and school leaders have to send out. It will also keep track of all of our uh, summary data, including the surveillance testing results that we do and track citywide statistics. So uh, New York City was the first jurisdiction in the entire country to come up with the idea of a situation room. It's part of how we brought back schools uh, last year, last fall. Uh, and so it remains a core of our approach. But as the mayor has said, what we're trying to do is actually to be even more swift with respect to identifying cases that's what uh, bringing to bear more testing and the rapid test kits allows us to do. And to actually get uh, kids who are um, in the same classroom as other cases tested more quickly, because from a public health perspective, identifying cases and getting them to isolate as soon as possible is even more important in the era of Omicron. So to sum up, the situation room uh, is evolving because the virus has evolved. Um, and these changes allow us to move even more quickly in curbing the spread of COVID in our schools. Amen. Next, we have Julia from the New York Post. Um, hi, Mr. Mayor. We confirmed that um, Mayor-elect Adams and Governor Hochul are gone, right? Yes, we did. 
Okay. Um, just a housekeeping thing. I'm sure everybody on the briefing would appreciate if um, either you have it now or could send us um, where that 98% statistic comes from. It's it's quite compelling. Yeah, we'll have Department of Health get that to you, Julia. Thanks so much. Um, and then for yourself and for the chancellor, how much is this driven um, the the new the new school um, quarantine policy? driven by the long-term impact of, of larger system-wide shutdowns and, and what would, that would be on the city um, and parents maybe pulling their kids out once and for all, given the, the uh, disruptions that you talked about? Well, it's an important question, Julia, but I'm happy to tell you that's not a factor. We have not seen uh, parents um, turning away because of the different challenges. In fact, what we've seen, my, my experience, and I'll turn to the chancellor as well, is that uh, parents came to appreciate their schools more than ever. There are always demographic changes. Uh, there's always different uh, evolutions in how many kids are enrolled in school in any given year. But now that the striking thing to me has been people are probably more bonded with their local school than ever at this point. But the continuity of the kids' education, that's a factor for sure. That's something we cared about a lot, making sure that we, our kids could be in school uh, particularly as we continue to overcome what happened in the last two years. And the growing recognition of ways we could do it safely as we keep learning more. And again, this was led by our healthcare leaders who said, this is, this is a way we can do things now that matches what we now know. Not what we knew a year or two ago, but what we know now. Uh, as to uh, keeping the schools consistent and how important that is for the kids' experience and the parents' experience, Chancellor, you want to add? Absolutely. I mean, we, we've said and we've known all along that the best learning happens in person between students and teachers. Having great partners like Dr. Choksi, who understands that from the health side and the academic side because of his life is also equally important. Um, and you heard from Fabian, you heard from a parent who talked about how important it was for him and what he saw when he got his, his children back in school. And so while folks were initially worried about what it would mean, we all knew it was best. And every day that we work, we work to make sure that we can keep our students in school and in classrooms. And that's what remains important. Amen. Julia, go ahead. Um, switching topics a, a bit, still on COVID um, with, um, you know, the key to NYC, uh, the new rules for, for kids starting yesterday. We spoke to several foreign tourists um, who were denied entry to eateries because their kids hadn't been vaccinated, including a family from Costa Rica where it's not available for that age group. You know, they said when they booked their trips uh, months ago, they, you know, the, this policy wasn't in effect. Um, and several restaurants who turned away, you know, dozens of customers and um, we're unhappy about the economic impact. So can you just speak to those frustrations and, and what, if anything, did the city do to reach out to, you know, foreign travelers and, and let them know about this? Um, you know, our team at uh, NYC and company that does uh, the tourism promotion, you know, and our health department folks who are working with them, uh, we can get you more information on that. But what I'd say is, even though I always appreciate any concern of, if folks in the restaurant community have a concern, if some of our visitors have a concern, I obviously appreciate that deeply, that we wanna uh, be uh, responsive in every way. But in the end, the number one job is to protect people. And we uh, have had this vaccine mandate for our indoor dining, entertainment, uh, and fitness now for months and months. Uh, so for anyone, to be able to meet that mandate, they have to be vaccinated. That's been very, very well publicized. Um, by saying that now it's time to make sure people have gotten that second dose, uh, obviously the vast, vast majority of people in the city uh, who have been vaccinated have had the second dose. A lot of people are able to get it right now. So we expect for the people we serve, uh, city residents, and including folks in the metropolitan area where overwhelmingly uh, folks have gotten their second dose, uh, it does not disrupt their ability to take advantage of everything covered by Key to NYC. For our foreign visitors, we've you know, made very, very clear that vaccination is part of being able to experience uh, the Broadway community. It's part of being able to experience uh, indoor dining. And for anyone who 
uh, wants to get vaccinated, we will do uh, happily what we can to help them. But the big picture here is it's about the safety of all New Yorkers and about our recovery, and this was the right thing to do for that. Next, we have Gwen from WNYC. Hey, can you hear me, Mr. Mayor? Yeah, Gwen, how you doing? I'm doing good. Thanks for taking my question. Um, I just wanted to clarify, is this, um, does this testing and at-home test kits include 3K and pre-K students and ta staff, this increase? And um, we're trying to understand uh, in terms of the opt-in test rate, we haven't received any new data from your office for several months. We had it at less than 25% students and staff opting in. We know that you were required to release more data on this. So can you give us an update on what those opt-in numbers look like if you've said that the numbers are gonna be very good? Thank you. Yeah, and I, uh, Gwen, thank you for the question. And uh, if we have it, uh, if uh, Dr. Choksi or Dr. Excuse me, Dr. Choksi or, or Chancellor Porter have it available uh, right now, we'll give you the latest. If not, our team will uh, get it to you later on today. We've we've never had a problem getting the number of kids and adults tested we needed to. We just haven't. And and again, what's so striking is that the consistency of the results over months and months and months. And when we, are, um, when we are thinking about testing every week as it's been done um, in so many schools, in a vast school system, and the results are almost entirely consistent week after week after week, that tells you something. That's just science. Um, so we feel very good about what we've done before. I have been handed a note. This is what's in. So approximately 330,000 consent forms are in, but remember those, there was not a request made to parents of vaccinated kids. So now we will ask them. And again, I expect that community of parents to be very responsive and we'll see those numbers go up a lot. Pre-K, 3K, um, I'll ask uh, Dr. Chalks or Dr. Long. I, I had not heard of any difference in the approach. Is there anything different with pre-K or 3K? Dr. Choksi, Dr. Long. No differences, sir. No difference. We're doubling our current surveillance program. Same, same approach across all grade levels. Thank you. Go ahead, Gwen. Oh, right. oh, sorry. Yeah. Um, so I'm sorry. You said 330 consent forms, 330,000, excuse me. Are those all opt in or do those include the negative opt out test forms as well? My understanding that, is those are 330,000 that are willing to have their kids tested. But again, that's before okay. we've now turned to the parents of the vaccinated kids, which I think is gonna lead that number to go up quite a bit. Okay, next we have Katie from the city. Hey, good morning, Mayor. Is it afternoon yet? It's, I'm sorry, I've lost track of time. Uh, good morning, Mayor de Blasio, how are you? Good, how you doing, Katie? I'm, um, you know, I'm good. I'm good. Um, my question is actually for Dr. Toxie. I see him pacing over there. Um, uh, yesterday, my colleague Maya Kaufman at Cranes specifically asked about uh, remarks he made to Department of Health staffers about his efforts to get a teleworking policy. Uh, I guess he spoke with people, either you at City Hall or other people. So I wanted to get his take on what he said and I guess what he feels could be an effective telework policy, especially as there are reported cluster cases and, and other issues in uh, in city agency offices. Well, again, I'll turn to Dr. Choksi, but I want to just frame this again. When we when we um, say reported cluster cases, I'd just be a little careful with that. Um, Test and Trace has been looking very carefully where there's something generated uh, in a site versus the widespread um, existence of Omicron that we know is happening all over the city. So I want to be careful with that term. But in terms of remote work, I've said, Different discussion when you're talking about a uh, workforce that's 94% vaccinated and different discussion when you're talking about folks who uh, serve all of us and we need serving all of us in the highest, best way while we're still fighting off COVID. Uh, so I, sometimes I think a comparison is made sort of private sector, public sector. I don't think that's a fair comparison. Public sector folks, public employees are here to serve everyone. We need them. We've also made sure that their level of vaccination is far beyond uh, what we see almost anywhere else. And, and that has framed our thinking on all this. Dr. Choksi? 
Uh, thank you so much, sir. And uh, yes, just to underline uh, the point that you made, which is that we are seeing significant levels of community transmission, of course, and that's what is uh, the uh, the primary driver of the increase in cases in recent weeks um, with uh, the advent of the Omicron variant. And Katie, with respect to your question, uh, you know, the, the policies about um, work, uh, including remote work or hybrid work, uh, are set by uh, by the mayor and the Department of Citywide Administrative Services. Um, certainly, uh, you know, as, as always, I, I provide my um, best uh, public health guidance in formulating those policies. Uh, and that is why um, we have been able to make workplaces um, as safe as possible with uh, our vaccine requirement, with uh, universal masking uh, in place across city agencies, uh, with emphasizing the importance of ventilation and distancing when possible. Uh, so those are all layers of mitigation that do help to make um, in, in person, uh, you know, office work as safe as possible. Uh, the last thing that I'll say, which, you know, I've shared with my, my team as well, is that we are public servants. Um, the city is relying upon us. And I think about uh, all of the school staff who are going in person each day. I think about all of the healthcare workers who are showing up at hospitals each day. Uh, and we do as public servants have a responsibility to continue uh, serving the city to the best of our ability. Thank you. Thank you. Go ahead, Katie. Thanks. I, I don't think Dr. Tross Choksi answered my question. I asked specifically about what he told Department of Health staffers at a town hall as reported by uh, Maya Kaufman at Cranes, but um, I'll move on. Um, I, I don't know if he'll, he'll answer that. Uh, my question, I guess, it pivots to something differently, Mayor de Blasio, and it's looking ahead um, to your future. I know you've been very coy and, and cute about being vague about what's happening next, but I just think, I know you hate the hypothetical questions, but I heard you answer one on Morning Joe, so I'll give it a shot. Let's say, hypothetically, you run for governor and it's not successful. You know, in, any, in some kind of crazy universe, you run and it's not successful. What have you put any thought into like a plan B about what you might do next? You're going to write a book, host a radio show, be an adjunct professor. I'm just kind of curious what you think could be next if um, you don't end up running for governor. Just public service. I, I'll, I'll just leave you with that. Public service. It's been my life. It's what I believe in. It's what I'm going to keep doing. We have time for two more for today. Next, we have Paul from the Staten Island Advance. Hey, good morning, Mr. Mayor. How you doing? Good, Paul. How you doing? I'm well, sir. Thank you. Uh, for you and the health professionals on the call regarding take home tests, how concerned are you with the variables these tests present, human error, or people trying to game the test? That's, that was a powerful question, Paul. I appreciate it. Um, and I'll uh, turn to my colleagues in a second. I want to get Dr. Katz into the discussion, too, because we haven't heard his voice yet, and he is a voice of wisdom. Um, Look, I think that we should see the tests as one of many tools. Um, the fact is the overall reality is that our kids are better off in school for, you heard, you heard all the doctors talk about that today and other days and the chancellor, our kids are better off in school in general. And the school environment is incredibly safe. So these are two huge, huge foundational facts. Then when you talk about the way of making sure things are being handled. You have the in-school PCR testing, and then you have whatever parents do in terms of their own additional PCR testing, which a lot of parents are doing with their kids. And then you have the test kits, which I think the vast majority of parents are gonna use effectively. So I do think it has to be put into context. But in terms of your very fair points, you know, what if someone doesn't use them properly, doesn't understand them, uh, or has other you know, approaches, Dr. Katz, what would you say to that? Uh, well, thank you very much, sir, for asking, and I do think it's a good question. Uh, the test kits, uh, I've certainly done them myself. Um, they're not, you know, super easy, but the, with the instructions, they are entirely doable. Uh, you have to read the instructions, um, but uh, if you read the instructions, you will get it right, and New Yorkers are a smart and savvy group, and I believe in them. Um, Beyond that, in terms of gaming the test, that seems very improbable uh, to me because whether you're an adult or you're a parent, um, the test has meaning. Um, if your kid 
you know, test positive. I don't think you want to send that kid to school. I can't imagine parents wanting to send their positive kid to school, um, knowing that their kid could infect others and the same with adults uh, getting the, the uh, test kits. So uh, our experience has been very positive. New Yorkers have been using those tests very responsibly. And we think that it's a very important part of our layers of protection. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Go ahead, Paul. Thank you very much for that. And uh, regarding city-run testing sites, I understand we're adding more, but a uh, review yesterday found th only three out of 10 were open to children under four. So specifically, what's being done to ensure testing availability for those youngest New Yorkers who are still unable to be vaccinated? I'll turn to Dr. Katz and Dr. Long. It's a very important, uh, very important point that obviously parents of the youngest kids are concerned and need the option uh, to test the kids if they want to. Uh, but let's, let's frame it, first of all, for, with, from the advice perspective. Dr. Katz, if, if a parent of a younger, you know, one of the youngest kids wants to get that kid tested, what do you advise in general? Come to a health and hospital site. Um, uh, I understand the issue. Um, many of these test sites, you know, are not used to handling little children. They're not used to squirming toddlers, uh, but we are at health and hospitals. And uh, we will turn no child away. And frankly, we have the fastest turnaround time for getting that result. So I think if you're an adult, there are a variety of settings that you can go to. And you should choose the one nearest to you and with the shortest line. I think if you have a young child under five, bring them to a health and hospitals facilities. We're used to taking care of little children. Thank you, sir. Thank you. And Dr. Long, in terms of the range of options for parents, anything you want to say about that? I want to double down on what Dr. Katz said. Uh, we would love to see your children. I brought my a uh, son who was less than two years old when I got him tested the first time uh, to a health and hospital site. We do an amazing job. Please come to see us. We'd love to take care of your children. And um, with respect to uh, pre-K and 3K, I just wanted to clarify my comment from a minute ago. This is actually a good time. Uh, bring, we want to see your kids in pre-K and 3K at our hospital sites too to give them the best experience. Our surveillance program currently is for elementary and high schools, uh, and, th and that we're going to be doubling um, effective January 3rd. So for pre-K and 3K students, definitely bring them to us. We will, we'd like to see them. Clarifying with you, Dr. Long, elementary, middle, high school, that's, those are all the levels. So basically from K to 12 is where we will be doing the doubling of the amount of tests. I'm saying it right? Right, sir. Okay, great. Thank you. Our last question for today goes to Aaron from Politico. Hi, Mr. Mayor. Um, I wanted to ask about uh, some of the details of this um, uh, school testing coming back after a negative test. Um, can you just clarify, so they, they're given the at-home test, do they have to submit some kind of proof? Do you physically bring in your little card with the negative line on it, or do you just uh, take people's word for it if they say they tested negative? How does that uh, aspect work? Dr. Choksi, you want to cover that one? Uh, certainly, sir. Uh, and the brief answer is that um, it will be uh, an attestation, you know, either by the child if they're old enough or by the parent. Uh, and we will fold that into the health screening process that already exists, um, you know, each day when a child is coming to school. So basically, um, if a, a child is given a rapid test kit, uh, they have to use it um, as is described. Uh, have the, the two negative tests within seven days and, of course, remain asymptomatic. And all of that um, will be ascertained based on uh, the health screening process. Thank you. Go ahead, Aaron. Okay, thanks. And then I wanted to ask um, both you and the, and the uh, doctors, the CDC cut down the recommended isolation period to uh, five days. Um, I'm wondering, you know, there's been some controversy about this among public health experts, some saying it's not enough or that a negative test should be required. Wanted to get your thoughts on the policy as well as, you know, what New Yorkers should uh, be doing and whether this will affect uh, how this will affect, you know, policies for city workforce and so on. 
Well, thank you. For, it's a really important question, Aaron. Thank you for it. I'll start and turn to Dr. Katz first. Um, I think the CDC, and first of all, under President Biden, the CDC has been tremendously helpful to New York City. We, we had a very rocky experience previously, but uh, in, the, in the previous administration, but with President Biden, the CDC has been a clear, strong voice guiding us with the latest uh, data, the latest science. Uh, tremendously helpful. I think the decision it made makes sense, and it, it is responsive to everything we've learned about COVID, to the nature of Omicron, to the fact that we have to keep our recovery moving forward, uh, all of these things. Um, and so I think it, it was very much the right decision and we'll work with it. But now for a doctor's perspective, Dr. Katz. Uh, thank you, sir. And, and I too support what the CDC has done. What they're focused on is the question of when is a person infectious? That's the most important issue in terms of deciding uh, isolation. And what the data show are that persons are most infectious right before they become symptomatic and for a few days after they become symptomatic. And then by later on in the course, um, they are not any more highly transmissible. Um, there are still possibilities of transmission beyond the five days. And that's why the guidance is paired with a strict have to wear a high quality mask. Uh, because it's not a zero proposition. But I feel very comfortable if people isolate for five days, are completely asymptomatic, which is another thing that people have to realize. Um, the guidance is not that you have a runny nose and you're coughing, but it's five days, so you're free to go out. The guidance is that if you are completely asymptomatic, and that's because we know that when people are asymptomatic, they are less likely to be shedding virus. So it's five days, you're asymptomatic, uh, and you are still wearing a high quality mask uh, to protect others. And with, with those provisions, I feel very comfortable with the CDC guidance. Thank you, sir. Thank you, and thanks to all our doctors for always helping the people of this city to understand uh, how we make it through together. And I'll just finish by saying, New Yorkers, you've done an amazing job. Uh, you have listened to the doctors. You've acted in, in a way that's really made the city proud. Uh, let's do it again. Get out there. Get that vaccine if you haven't already. Get your young person vaccinated. But especially take advantage of that booster incentive. We have an incredible opportunity through Friday, through the end of Friday. Get that booster. It has proven to be incredibly effective against Omicron. And this is part of how we move New York City forward and achieve a recovery for all of us. Thank you, everybody.